Good morning, Bellevue. It's good to be with you again this morning. Uh, I hope you and your family had a happy Independence Day. I'm assuming you're watching this uh, sometime after July 4th. I'm actually recording this on July 2nd. And July 2nd, just to give you a little American Revolution trivia, July 2nd was the day that John Adams thought that we ought to be celebrated. You see, the motion was made in front of Continental Congress to declare our independence, and that motion was not voted on until July 2nd. And on that day, then Congress decided that we would uh, declare ourselves as a united and free independent states. John Adams, who became the first vice president and the second president of the United States, wrote in a letter to his wife that July 2nd will be celebrated as a great anniversary festival. The second day of July 1776 will be the most memorable epochal in the history of America. I am apt to believe that it will be celebrated by succeeding generations as the great anniversary festival. It ought to be commemorated as the day of deliverance by solemn acts of devotion to God Almighty. It ought to be solemnized with, solemnized with pomp and parade, with shows and games and sports and guns and bells and bonfires and illuminations from one end of this continent to the other from this time forward forevermore. So why do we celebrate July 4th as Independence Day? Because that's the actual day that the Congress approved the actual document written by Thomas Jefferson and a few tweaks by the Congress, and it was approved on July 4th. Now, the document was rushed off to the publisher, returned to Congress, and it was actually not signed to July 8th. Now, something about that date that rings a bell in my head, but anyway. But, but Adams still felt like July 2nd was the day we should celebrate, and for the remaining 50 years of his life, he never celebrated July 4th as Independence Day. Now, he died 50 years later in 1826. Ironically, he died on July 4th. And that same day, the author of the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson, also died. Just a little story that I found enjoyable. hope you did, too. But today, we're going to look at a prophet who declared his own independence from God. And we're going to look at what happened to him and how God used him to show his mercy. And we're going to talk about today the prophet Jonah. Now, to set the stage, let's look at this chronology here on the slide one. Uh, we've talked about Elijah. We can see that Elijah was from like 900 to 850 B.C. These times are all rough. You can't get any scholar to agree on these times. And Elijah uh, prophesied to Israel during the time of Ahab. Then Elisha took over somewhere around 855 to 840. He also prophesied to Israel during the time of Ahab and Ahaziah. And as Roger told us last week, he also dealt with the king of Syria. Now we pick up with Jonah. It's a little bit after Elisha, kind of around 810 to 790. Now, Jonah started prophesying to Israel during the time of Jehoash and Jeroboam II, but then he moved on to Nineveh, and that's where we're going to pick up with the story today. Jonah is going to be the prophet to Nineveh. So our, our first point is going to be that, that God pursues a rebellious people and a rebellious prophet. And let's look at our reading. We're going to be in Jonah 1, verses 1 through 4, and again in verse 17. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare, and he went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord heard a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so the ship threatened to break up. And we skip down to verse 17. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now, uh, let's look at this map here that shows us kind of the map of the Middle East during Jonah's time. Jonah was a prophet from the village of Gath-Hefer, 
which was located about three miles north of Nazareth in the lower part of Galilee. Today, that village exists there by the name of Mashhad. But Jonah had faithfully served God as a prophet in Israel. We see that in 2 Kings 14, verse 25. And, and it's interesting to note, to note that uh, in John 7, 52, the Pharisees were arguing about Jesus, about his authenticity, and, and they talked about where he came from. And one of the Pharisees said, Search and look, for no prophet has ever risen out of Galilee. Well, the Pharisees were wrong because Jonah was actually from Galilee, and as 2 Kings tells us, he actually prophesied to Israel. Now, Jonah is the only prophet that Jesus actually likened to himself. In Matthew 12, we see that Jesus compares Jonah's experience uh, of his death and his burial and the resurrection as kind of a, a type to himself. Unlike all the other Old Testament books, Jonah is the only book that resolves exclusively around a Gentile nation. Now, as an Israelite, uh, Jonah knew God. He knew that God had created the heavens and the earth, and he knew about God's promises and about his holiness. But Jonah did not have a heart that trusted God and obeyed his commandments. So you see, Jonah too, was a sinner in need of a savior. Now, the second map here shows uh, Jonah's travels. Uh, God wanted Jonah to go to Nineveh. Now, uh, Nineveh was a prominent city in Assyria. It's 250 miles northeast of Joppa. Now, they didn't have the Mosaic law. They didn't have the prophets. They had no covenants with God. So, in effect, some of their disobedience could be tied to their ignorance. But God was aware of their evil, and he was about to bring judgment upon them. They also were sinners in need of a Savior. Now, Nineveh was known for its vicious and violent ways against anyone who would oppose it, and they'd already oppressed Israel in war and in tribute payments. In the book of Nahum, Nineveh is called the bloody city, completely full of lies and pillage. And secular history tells us about this time that Nineveh was suffering through a series of plagues. So when the word of God came to Jonah to preach a message to Nineveh, he went in the opposite direction. Tarshish is in present-day Spain and exported, uh, it exported a lot of metals to Palestine and Phoenicia. So there were a lot of ships going back and forth between uh, Tarshish and that area. And so Jonah decided to hop on one of those ships. Now Tarshish was 2,500 miles west of Joppa. So that would be like me telling you, I want you to go to Atlanta. And you decided you were going to go to Seattle, Washington. It's like you're telling me you want to get as far away from me as you can. And that's what Jonah was telling God. He, he wanted to get as far away from God as, as he could. But you can't get away from God. Now, no doubt, uh, Jonah thought, if I go to Nineveh, a, a, a wicked city, my health could be, um, and well-being could be threatened. And he probably also thought, well, what will the people back in Israel say when they find out that I have uh, been preaching in, in, in Nineveh? That could be the reasons that Jonah was reluctant. But probably the main reason was that Jonah hated the Ninevites, and he wanted to see them destroyed, and he feared that if he went and preached to these people, God might end up sparing them. Now, it's interesting to note here that uh, even though the Ninevites were not part of God's chosen people and did not know the law, their ignorance did not excuse them from God's judgment. It's also interesting to note that Jonah knew the law, but his disobedience could also uh, end up being a, a problem for Jonah. So when it comes to rebelling against God, both Jonah who knew God and the Ninevites who didn't know God uh, were guilty and would be judged accordingly. Both needed 
God's grace. But God does not enjoy punishing people. He'd rather see people repent than punish them. And he was going to give the Ninevites an opportunity to repent. Now, I think it's also interesting to note that because of Jonah's disobedience, we see there were consequences to that. We see that the, the ship uh, went through this terrible storm. And the ship was damaged. The, the, the sailors suffered greatly. The cargo owners certainly suffered greatly. So, so it shows that there's a consequence to our disobedience of God. Now, the good news here was that the sailors recognized the power of God, and they began to offer sacrifices to God, and, to, and they were worshiping God, in fact, better than even Jonah was. And so it shows that even in the time of misfortune, there is an opportunity for hope. Now, sometimes we can relate to Jonah's desire to run away from, from God and his, uh, his commands. And sometimes we justify our own disobedience. You know, every Christian, whether you're brand new or whether you've been a Christian for decades, will sooner or later probably encounter a command that, from God that makes you feel uh, uncomfortable, perhaps. You know, it could, be, uh, it could be a command that gets us out of our comfort zone, uh, could be a command that prohibits something that we desire to do or a command that tells us that we must love our enemies or we must treat people how we want to be treated. Uh, there's just sometimes there's these commands that come up and we just don't want to obey them or don't obey them. And sometimes we have lots of good reasons and we have justifications and we have excuses but this shows that disobedience, regardless of the good reason, is still disobedience. Now, the second point here we want to look at is God extends mercy to rebellious people and to a rebellious prophet in this case. So we're going to jump ahead in the story a little bit. We're going to go to uh, uh, Jonah's second chapter, verse 10, and continue in the third chapter. And the Lord spoke to the fish. And it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least. In verse 10, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented on the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Now, I'm not going to go into any detail about the great fish. Uh, you can read about that. Uh, it, it's, it's not a whale. The, the Hebrew word and the, and the Greek word both say great fish fish. And, uh, you know, if I, if I can believe in a God that created the universe, if I can believe in a God that uh, performs miracles and a God that raises the dead, then I have no problem believing that Jonah can survive three days in the belly of a great fish. So Jonah was disobedient, but God spared him. Uh, but because of he was disobedient because of God's mercy. This does not exempt him or disqualify him even from his ministry. Uh, God showed Jonah mercy, but the mercy does not exempt him or us from following God's commands. Now, notice God doesn't change his commands. He doesn't alter his requirements uh, when, he, when he gives us mercy. He doesn't say to Jonah, well, okay, that was that was a pretty hard command. I see that, Jonah. That was a pretty hard command. You didn't like it. It made you uncomfortable. So therefore, I'm going to change the command. God, God didn't do that. In verse, uh, in chapter three, verse two, God repeats the exact same command that He gave to Jonah in chapter one, verse two: Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it. The message remains the same. God's character does not change. 
Jonah is the one who had to make the change. He had to acknowledge his sins, confess his sins, turn away from his rebellion, and obey God's command. Now, so we see then that, that Jonah obeys the word of the Lord and he sets out for Nineveh. So, so God's forgiveness and mercy did not exempt him from serving. In fact, it equipped him better to serve. God is a God of second chances. He gave Jonah a second chance. Uh, one of the great truths that we see in the Bible is that God hates sin. Yes, yes, he does, and he wants to destroy it. But God delights in showing mercy to his people. So Jonah finally arrived in Nineveh after his slight detour. And the sermon that he delivered by uh, two Ninevites was very short, only five words in the Hebrew language. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So Jonah goes to the city with a simple message. In 40 days, your city will be destroyed. Now the people believed. Even the king stepped down from his throne and he removed his robe and he repented. Now, in, in these words, we see two critical components here. The first that God had seen Nineveh's wickedness and he would no longer bear it. Judgment was coming. God's justice demands that sins be punished. But the second thing we see here, that there was time to repent. Now, Jonah preached for 40 days before the judgment would come. And so this seemed to imply that the Ninevites had time to repent and correct themselves if they would. Now, though the city deserves immediate destruction for their sins, God re revealed that, that he is merciful and he is forgiven. So led by the king, all the people decided uh, to turn away from their sin. They demonstrated the sincerity of their faith by dressing and uh, by ceasing all normal activities. They fasted, they prayed, they dressed in sackcloth like mourners. Uh, but those acts, the fasting and the, and the sackcloth and the praying, <clears throat> uh, that's not the main thing. The main thing, <clears throat> excuse me, is that the people turn from their evil which showed that they had true repentance so in response god decided not to send the disaster that he had planned to send no you know as humans sometimes we we might enjoy seeing people get their just due uh, and, and sometimes we think uh a last minute repentance does not make up for decades of of evil that there should be punishment repentance or not but God doesn't work that way God doesn't think that way he doesn't think like us and we don't have God's understanding God in his mercy offers a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance every chances he takes God gives us time he will extend his mercy by giving us another chance. And he will try to change us so that we will trust and, and obey him. God is slow to anger and quick to forgive. And God is merciful. Let's look, let's look at our third point today. Uh, God reveals his patient love for rebellious people and the prophet. Patient love is the key here. And let's look at the uh, a reading in chapter 4. Verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. In verse 8. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be ang angry for the plant? And he said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, 
nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left hand, and also much cattle? So this unexpected success that resulted from Jonah's preaching allowed Nineveh to escape their calamity. So when God saw their repentance, he relented from his anger. But when Jonah saw the same result, he was angry. He was greatly dis displeased. Uh, and we see, uh, we see Jonah full of pity here. And he, he, saw, he saw the repentance and, and the disaster averted, and he just wished that he was dead. It, you know, when I see Jonah here, I, I picture... Uh, Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh, you know, just such gloom and doom, and that's how that's how Jonah is here. He doesn't he he feared that God would do this same thing, that God would show compassion to the people uh, of Nineveh, and now his fears have come true. But but rather being being angry at Jonah, God was not angry at Jonah, and God was very patient. That's the key point here. God was. He revealed his patient love here. God told Jonah that I planted a plant for you to shield you from the sun, and that made you happy. But then I appointed a worm to eat the plant and leave you exposed to the sun, and, and now you want to die again. So, so God was trying to show Jonah, you have more compassion for this plant that you did not plant than you do for the people of Nineveh who are on the verge of dying. God is trying to use Jonah's reaction against him to tell him that your, your priorities are not right. Your priorities are not in line with my priorities. He was trying to show Jonah the condition of his heart is not correct. He, he, does, not, he does not rejoice over the fact that Thousands, hundreds of thousands of people have been saved. Now, whether this 120,000 who don't know their right hand and their left hand, whether that means they were 120,000 children who were not smart enough to know that, or does it mean, or is God trying to say these were people who were spiritually immature? They didn't necessarily know right from wrong. Uh, but, but, but God says he, he took their immaturity into consideration in, in their judgment and he's uh, telling Jonah that uh, if, if Jonah needs to feel compassion, the same compassion for these people that God felt for him. Now, the book and the story of Jonah ends with this question. Should God not have compassion? He says, should I not have compassion? We don't get Jonah's response. The book ends without telling us whether Jonah responded positively. Did he, did he come to his right being? And I, I want to hope that he did, that he saw the light, if you will, that he, he now understands what God is, is trying to do. Uh, perhaps the question was rhetorical. and God is saying, how can I not show compassion? Can, can I not? show compassion. God had compassion for Nineveh, but he also had compassion for Jonah. God knew what was in Jonah's heart from the very beginning, and he was trying to reach Jonah's heart and to change him. We are Jonah. We are rebellious people. We're called to obey God's commandments, and, and sometimes... Sometimes we don't. We are people in need of God's grace. We are people who need to align our hearts with God's hearts. We have been called to show mercy to others because mercy has been extended to us. We are the people who need to take the message that God will judge the world, but there is time to repent if we believe in Jesus Christ, he will rescue us. In 2 Peter 3, verse 9, it says, 
The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Jesus on the cross fulfilled God's justice and mercy for sinners. Jonah was a prophet who rejected God's call. Jesus was the son of God who followed God's call. Jonah ran from God and he ran from his enemies. Jesus embraced his enemies and loved his enemies. And Jonah obeyed grudgingly and Jesus obeyed joyfully. So when Jesus was talking about Jonah in Matthew 12, he ended with this. Behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Thank you for being with us today. I want to ask you all to remember to stay safe and to love your neighbor. And one way you can do that is by wearing your mask. Thanks.